Hello, everyone, and welcome to Counting Land, the second of the Buell's Conversations on Architecture and Land in the Americas with Alma Steingart and Benedict Cluet. My name is Lucia Alais. I'm the director of the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture at Columbia University. Uh, there will be one more of these conversations in the spring in two weeks with Tim Mitchell and Stephanie Barral, and I invite you to check the um, chat for details. Um, let me share my screen very So I'm joining you today from a campus on an island that lies within the ancestral homelands of the Leni Lenape people. Until about 1650, the Leni Lenape managed the forests, marshes, wilds, animals, floods and paths of this place by stopping in as they navigated what is now called the Hudson River, seasonally staying in small encampments, growing food, perhaps also harvesting crops, hunting and fishing some animal species, while conserving some others, periodically setting fires to control growth, and generally maintaining a resource ecology that stretched all along the Atlantic coast from what is now Western Connecticut to Delaware and including most of New Jersey and Southern New York. By the end of the 17th century, the Lenny Lenape have been largely driven out of their homelands. And in the centuries since, their communities have been decimated, their humanity denied and their descendants dispersed. The European settler state that was responsible for this erasure and diaspora relied overwhelmingly on the institutionalization of land. Columbia University, a land-based institution, is a legacy of this urge to settle and appropriate. In fact, the red brick building in which I sit today, which is shown here on the bottom, embodies architecture's imbrication with settled land in a particularly vivid way. Buell Hall, as it's called, is the oldest building on campus, so old that it precedes the campus precedes the university's arrival on this site. It was built in 1885 for an earlier institution, the Bloomingdale Asylum, that had existed on the site since 1821. So central was architecture to maintaining institutional legitimacy on this land, that not only did, did Columbia decide to keep this building when it purchased the land in 1892, but the building was preserved and moved twice, 42, 42 feet vertically and 97 feet north in 1895, as the campus expanded and the trustees negotiated with the city where grid and campus could intersect. In other words, the institutionalization of land produces architectural legacies, some of which are more honorific than others. For example, and it's the example that is significant to us, at the same time as this campus was being built, indeed the same year as the first class, a class in Greek was taught in this building in 1897, the General Allotment Act was signed by the United States government. Its goal was to break up the large reservations of land into which indigenous communities had been gathered since the 1830s after fleeing persecution. The Lenape communities today reside largely in Oklahoma and in Texas. The Allotment Act also had far reaching consequences. It shrank the land base of surviving indigenous communities and compelled them to adopt Western institutions such as that of private property and of family farming. I recount this history today, not only to acknowledge the role that our hosting institutions have played in these communities displacement, but also because the relation of land and architecture is a theme of our series. And it takes the form of an open question. How do we tell non-objectivizing histories of land? How do we heed the insight on the part of indigenous scholars and activists that land isn't an object, but a relationship? The title of our conversation today is Counting Land. And so I'll just explain this title briefly. It seems perhaps self-evident that to count land is to objectify it, but less obvious perhaps is the role that this objecthood plays in the political process of the United States. Representative democracy in the United States requires counting people, and there has never been a way to count political persons without also counting land. So today we'll hear stories of gerrymandering, and I'm showing you two images from our speakers' presentations. It's a particularly contemporary topic which is usually discussed as a problem of cartographic representation, a problem of how a political ideal, one person, one vote, should be mapped in space. But as our two speakers will discuss, gerrymandering is in fact just one symptom of the kind of friction that exists between political boundaries and physical boundaries. And one way that they have been made to overlap or not through various real and imagined calculative processes. 
And so just by way of introduction, we should remind ourselves that the tools for making political geometries consist not only of districting maps, but also include many other spatial apparatuses that are familiar to an architectural audience such as ours. So to continue with the history of this land that I'm sitting on today, property surveying, for example, has long served to furnish the kind of political geometry. For example, in 1801, the land that I sit on today was made to count politically by being surveyed. First, it was measured with this instrument on the left, a gunter chain whose size was calibrated to 20 meters. And then the plot size and its regularized shape were recorded in a ledger, along with other kinds of property that was owned by the Depester brothers, such as the number of their family members and of enslaved workers. The brothers were then, they themselves, counted as part of the United States Census, which recorded them as property owners, a precondition for their being able to vote at the time. Second example, planning and infrastructural devices have also served to provide political geometries, allowing a speculative count of counting, again, taking the example of Columbia or in the grid of Manhattan. There are many other kinds of infrastructures which are used today to make political geographies and geometries. In the case of Manhattan, it's the grid. Just as Buell Hall preceded Columbia on this spot, so Columbia University preceded the United States as a corporation, having been incorporated at Skink's College in 1754, and also moved three times over the course of the next two centuries. And with each move, the university's trustees, of which there are 24, negotiated the political personhood of the institution, not only by counting land value, tax exonerations, or the size of their student body, but also by using the grid as a kind of speculative technology to estimate their own capacity to populate an entire neighborhood of Manhattan. So here on the left, Morningside Heights had exactly one inhabited house before Columbia moved. And on the right, as soon as Columbia moved, then the entirety of the grid became a residential grid full of people. This leads to my last example, address. Address is an eminently architectural device that grants people a political power through calculation. Still today, the trustees of Columbia, to use the example one last time, are the largest landowners in New York City, if you count the number of addresses. So while the tendency is to think of an address as a singular location in space that gives you your singular individual vote, in fact, this map, this map, which is a map of what Columbia owns around this campus, shows that its political relevance may well lie in an adjoining empty space. So our two speakers today bring us stories from the tail end of this history between counting and locating people drawn from the middle of the 20th century. Um, this is before addressing was an internet protocol, before the grid was negotiated through computers, and before property records were available to everybody's fingertips. And this leads me to my last uh, acknowledgement. We are meeting today remotely. This remoteness is made possible by hardware and software that consume immense amounts of energy, which is being supplied to each of us somehow extracted from land somewhere on the earth, somewhere we ourselves are not. So without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen and introduce the event to us. So this event today will take the form of two presentations followed by a Q&A. So add your questions in the chat if you have them, although I will let our two speakers ask questions of each other first. So our first speaker will be Alma Steingart. I'm very pleased that Alma has accepted to um, share her research with us. She's an assistant professor in the Department of History at Columbia University. Her work concerns the interplay between American politics and mathematical rationalities. Professor Steingart's current project, Accountable Democracy, examines how mathematical thought and computing technologies have impacted electoral politics in the United States in the 20th century. Her first book, though, will come out first. It's titled Axiomatic Mathematical Thought in high and High Modernism, and it's forthcoming next January from Chicago Press. Before joining Columbia, Steingart was a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, a pre-doctoral fellow at Max Planck Institute in Berlin. She earned her PhD in STS from MIT, and her work has appeared pretty much everywhere, including in Grey Room, Social Studies of Science, and the LA Review of Books. So um, Alma, go ahead and show your screen, and um, I'll let you have a go at it. You're muted. Of course I'm muted. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi. So thank you, Lucia, for this lovely uh, invitation and uh, for um, the uh, opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, and thank you for Jordan and for Jacob for helping to organize. Um, and finally, uh, thank you to for Benedict for presenting uh, his work alongside. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation uh, following our presentations. So in 1963, political scientist Alfred de Grazia published a book, Apportionment and Representative Government, which offered a sustained analysis of the history of the, politi the politics of apportionment in the United States. The impetus behind de Grazia's analysis was a 1962 ruling by the Supreme Court that malapportionment are justiciable, that malapportionment cases are justiciable. The case originated when citizens sued the state of Tennessee, claiming that the state legislator violated the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protections under the law because it failed to apportion the state general assembly since 1901. And of course, at that time, there are great demographic changes, that 60 years. The Supreme Court ruled that the appellants had standing and that their claim could be heard in the district court. A decision that overturned the court earlier position, the districting and apportionment were legislative matters and thus beyond the judicial branch ambit. Now, the Grazia was worried that the decision of the court will bring forward a day in which the dominant and even the only guide for redistricting would be population equality. Geographical, local, ethnic, and religious interests have all been taken into account in forming constituents in the past, and properly so in his view. If the only criteria for apportionment was numerical equality, then you might as well randomly draw names of residents from the half and assign each to a given district. So to note how absurd such principle would be, he invited the reader to imagine a computer algorithm, a computer algorithm that will divide the population into district. The outcome might be perfectly legal, but there will be no guiding principle behind it. Until a machine can do human work, it is best to limit its use strictly. And so also limit its use, the, the use of machine-like theories to try to organize society. American society is not a collection of faceless particles. It is composed of highly diverse and yet interconnected sets of people. A political theory suggesting that people are interchangeable like nuts and bolts is likely to both be fallacious and detrimental, detrimental to the personal happiness of the citizen. Now in the years that passed, the Gratia parody turned into reality. Almost as soon as the Supreme Court's 1962 ruling about malapportionment cases, uh, the case was Baker v. Carr, uh, uh, was uh, passed, programmers and social scientists began turning to computers to see how they might be used to redesign uh, quote unquote, fairer redistricting maps. So I want to describe three early such efforts. And I bring up these examples in order to probe how political boundaries, natural geography, and social and civic borders were mapped onto one another in light of this relatively new technology. And I find the 1960 especially interesting because it's a moment when computer technology was still it's an infancy. Computer displays were available but only rudimentary ones. As such, it is easier to see how the calculative logic of the computer redefined political geographies. So one of the earliest paper offering a computer solution to apportionment was published by James Weaver and Sidney Hess in 1963. The two met when they were worked together in Atlas Chemical Industries and they began collaborating, collaborating on the problem. Weaver was a member of a committee named the Committee of 39. It was a civic group, a group in Delaware that gathered historical data and information about apportionment to inform the apportionment battles in the state. And Hess was his younger colleague and was also a recent PhD in operation research, research from Case Western University. So the first question they had to face 
was what measure of compactness should they use? So from a mathematical perspective, the most compact figure is a circle because it maximized the district area to its parameter. However, there was no agreement, and I should say there is no agreement today either, about how compactness should be measured when it comes to redistricting. And I should also know that not all states even require um, uh, the district will be compact um, as part of their redistricting uh, requirements. So Weaver and Hastas decided to redefine and expand the definition of compactness. As they explained, quote, compactness is not solely a geographical measure because we're attempting to reflect at least at some extent popular interest in districting and because population patterns may, co may coincide with interest patterns. The principle of compactness is here defined as a measure of population as well as geographic concentration. In other words, the two wish to define compactness as combined spatial and demographic measurement. The larger claim you can say is that they um, argue that compactness when it comes to districting cannot be separated from the geography and demography cannot really be separate when we think about the, how we think about compactness uh, for districting. And the benefit as they explain is the district would be organized around population centers and hence would respect communities of interests. So having settled on a measurement, the second problem that Weaver and Haas confronted was how to write an algorithm that would produce a district map with optimized compactness. And the breakthrough came when Hess realized that this optimization problem was structurally similar to a well-known class of problems in operation research, a problem that's known as warehouse allocation or optimal transport. So the algorithm began by making an educated guess as to where those center of population should be. Using information from the census, the algorithm will then assign each enumeration district. And here, uh, all of this, of course, is based for the level of information that was available at a time uh, from the census. Uh, and they decided to use with the enumeration district, if I remember correctly, had about a thousand uh, uh, people in it. So the algorithm will then assign each, each of these enumeration district from the census into one of the legislative legislating district. When the process ended, the districting map is checked and new population centers are calculated. As long as they differ from the initial map, the process continues. And the goal is to get to some kind of equilibrium the population centers do not move that much. So at the end of the process, users are left with a set of districting maps, each with its own compactness measurement. Now Weaver and has titled the paper, a procedure for non-partisan districting. The promise of the computer as Weaver saw it was, the, was that it was quote, blind to politics. In the wake of Baker v. Carr, the author explained, courts may strike down representation scheme as unconstitutional, but there was no clear guidance as to how to administer relief. More often than not, the courts would choose to give the legislator another opportunity to draw a districting solution. But in cases when the additional attempt would fail, the court needs still to come up with a map. And it is at this stage that the court might wish to appeal to computers to produce a map. Since redistricting usually affect the political balance of the legislator, a court undertaking affirmative apportionment and redistricting is likely to become the subject of a highly partisan appeal and criticism. To avoid this political thicket, a court may desire to limit its own discretion in creating a new legislative district. In other words, the computer was this objective tool that will be remove human discretion. But not everyone adhere to such a concept of mechanical objectivity. Chandra Davis, sorry, Chandler uh, Stevens, uh, himself a representative in Massachusetts House of Representatives between the years of 1965 and 1968, saw the computer as augmenting humans, not replacing them. There are certain criteria he believed 
which could not be quantified or computerized, but which were nonetheless important. As an elected official, Stevens maintained that additional criteria besides population equality, compactness, should enter into legislator decision-making. I personally feel that we need much better correspondence between election districts and other districts used to, for regional planning, mass transportation, mental health, pollution control, welfare and employment services, and a myriad of other programs. Using the visual display, and this was one of the kind of innovative moment for Stevens was the idea to actually use a, a visual display, basically a TV uh, uh, monitor. Stephen envisioned a system in which the user can project on top of a given map slides of additional information, such as, and this is his example, newspaper reading patterns or commuting patterns. Considering the state of computer graphics at the time, it was literally a plastic overlay on top of the screen that Stephen advocated for. Each overlay thus represented another time type of land boundary. The computer might generate the political boundary of the state, but the overlays represented social and civic boundaries superimposed one on another. So it was main machine interaction that Stephen thought showed promise, not full automation. Unlike Hess and Weaver, Stevens believed that not only was there no room for subject, was there room for subjective judgment, but that such judgment was in fact necessary. He advanced this view when he declared that, quote, there is an art as well as science to drawing election district. Now, Stephen didn't mean art in derogatory sense to refer to gerrymandering. Rather, what he had in mind was, quote, the art of decision-making for the qualitative as opposed to the quantitative. Now, as Stevens uh, was developing his program, the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts ruled that the state's current congressional plan was unconstitutional and instructed the legislator to produce a new map. Stevens had a chance to put his program to test sooner than he planned. He was the sole independent lawmaker in the assembly and he tried to convince his colleague in the joint legislative committee that, uh, and that was the committee that was tasked with producing the new plan that they should use his computer program. His goal fundamentally was not so much to suggest a new plan, but rather to use the computer as a tool with which to evaluate the existing proposals. So Stephen ended up renaming Weaver and Hess measure, measurement of compactness as the Jerry Index. And in a public demonstration at MIT, Stephen sought to expose uh, to the Joint Legislative Committee uh, and he want to show them that their plan was actually the least compact. This type of public exposure, he later wrote, quote, should help hasten the day when state constitution will revise and or courts will be armed for the force of fair districting. So rather than simply serving as an aid to mathematical or calculative equality, Stephen also put also put uh, computing to work as a tool to oversee, evaluate, and even expose unfair apportionment and districting. A third approach to computerized redistricting came from a political scientist named Stuart Nagel. Alec Weaver and Hess, Nagel promoted the use of computers in districting as a bipartisan rather than a nonpartisan tool. Nagel believes that computers could help solve legislative deadlocks. Instead of helping the court, Nagel wanted to help elected officials. So in Illinois, Republicans and, Republicans and Democrats' inability to agree on new districting resulted at the time that Nagel was working in an eight at large election. At the same time, the parties were coming to similar deadlocks around the country. And Nagel envisioned a computer program that would save time and money by letting politicians examine a set of possible maps, working with these maps to arrive eventually to some kind of a compromise. He explained that this program was, quote, designed with realistic politics in mind. 
It therefore included passive voting records for each district and could in principle either produce a plan favoring one party over another, or it could also remain neutral. Such parameter, parameter, uh, parameter Nagel explained, quote, might be needing, needed to convert a compromise between the political parties into a redistricting pattern. Democrats and Republican, Nagel reasoned, would need to be able to predict how each party will fare in future election before they would be willing to sign off on a new districting map. And here you can see, uh, this is from Nagel paper, that there's information about um, uh, voting patterns. Nagel's belief that computerized districting should be used by politician shaped the algorithm, algorithmic approach he proposed. Unlike Cass and Weaver, Nagel's program aimed to improve upon already existing district. He didn't want to overhaul the entire districting plan. So instead of starting from scratch, at each step, the program created new maps by training a geographical unit from one district to another, and then checking if equality and compactness were improved. Nagel decided to adhere as closely as possible to state's existing map because it's aligned with his quote unquote, realistic approach. It is naive, he wrote, quote, to think that incumbent politicians are likely to want to upset the statute, quote, well, any more than the minimum extent required by state constitution and courts by the federal, uh, uh, and by the federal courts. So Nagel, in other words, never forgot that it was politician who approved new districting plans. Even if a computer had drawn the lines, fairness for him was a pragmatic rather than a theoretical concept, a compromise aided by computers. So the computational approach pursued in each of these three cases was strongly determined by the researcher's understanding of the nature of the problem. Weaver and Hess, who were operating outside of the political process, believed that districting can, and, and in fact, they should, be reduced to a purely technical problem. A state elected official, Stevens held that human judgment had a place in districting process and hence emphasized human machine interactions. And finally, Nagel as a behavioralist political scientist chose pragmatism over optimization. Computers were a tool for negotiation, not for full automation. Despite their differences, each of these early researchers wished to eliminate, eliminate direct human intervention from some part of the districting process. Computer, they believe, were apt for the job because they fundamentally subsume human intentionality to some, part, some kind of program randomness. Now, this is the 1960s, uh, all of these examples. And on the whole, their attempts were unsuccessful. The existing computational capacity at the time was very, very limited. And legislator, and, and they worked with different legislators around the countries. But at the end of the day, legislators around the countries put more trust in their hand-drawn maps. It's in fact only in recent years, in recent decades, that redistricting has become a fully computerized process. Nonetheless, the impact of these early attempts at computerized districting has been profound. So early decision did not call for perfect numerical equality. As Chief Justice Earl Warren warned in Reynolds uh, v. Sims, it's a 1964 case on uh, the districting after Baker v. Carr, quote, we realize that it is practical, practical impossibility to a practical impossibility to arrange legislative district so that each one has an identical number of residents or citizens or voters. Mathematical exactness of precision is hardly a workable constitutional requirement. Now, what happened is that in the following years from 1964, numerous cases arrived in state and federal courts, basically testing the limits of and the justification for permissible population 
uh, deviation between different districts. And it is exactly in this gray zone between mathematical exactitude and practical consideration that researchers first hailed computers as a possible solution. Legislators found computers attractive exactly because they could quickly compare how different districting plans deviated from total equality. The preservation of counties, historical and natural boundaries gave way over time to statistical equality. By the end of the decade, the Supreme Court began to tighten its expectation when it struck down the New York Congressional Districting Plan and then in the case is Wells uh, v. Rockefeller from 1969. And it struck it down for what they termed as excessive population deviation. So there was no clear standard was set, but following the ruling, legislator surmised that congressional district could be not deviate from one another for more than 1%. So now more than a yardstick or metric would reach to gouge equality. Mathematical equality became a guiding democratic principle in itself. Population equality became its own end rather than an indicator of fairness. In his dissenting opinion in Wells v. Rockefeller, the New York case, Justin Carlin wrote, quote, the court's exclusive concentration upon arithmetics blinds it to the realities of the political process as the Rockefeller case makes so clear. The fact of the matter is that the rule of absolute equality is perfectly compatible with gerrymandering of the worst uh, sort. And he then noted from his opinion, quote, computer may grind out district lines, which can totally frustrate the popular will on an overwhelming number of critical issues. The legislature might do more than satisfy one man, one vote. So what you see here is that Justin Harlan recognized that the mathematical exactness was a byproduct of computerization. And that he foresaw the problem of the future in which quote, a computer can produce countless plans for absolute population equality, one differing very little from one another, but each having its own very different political ramification. So if the governing criteria for districting was population equality, then computers, so the logic went, could easily and more efficiently than before, produce numerous configuration that would satisfy the legal requirement while allowing for political manipulation of any kind. By the, early by the early 1970s, Justice Holland's critique was taken by some political scientists as fully just. So Gordon E. Baker, a political scientist wrote, quote, the single-mindedness quest for mathematical equality of district at the expense of some adherence to local government subunits carries with it the potential for excessive gerrymandering. Baker celebrated, he celebrated the Supreme Court decision allowing a less strict numerical standard for state as opposed to congressional districts. I said, this development could help minimize some of the computerized equal population gerrymandering that ignored local governmental subunits as well as communities of interests. The computer, seen at first as a solution for gerrymandering, had within 10 years came to be its source. If numerical equality was intended as a constraint on lawmakers' ability to construct district map to favor their own interests, in the end, the implementation of population equality through computer technology increased their power to do so, and all within the law. So in keeping with the Buell Center theme, I was asked to use the history to comment on what might, what might this mean for how we might think about land. So as a political historian and historian of mathematics, my, my work is somewhat removed from the pure view of architectural history. But I was reminded, however, that Henry Lafave over, opens his The Production of Space, the, the Production of Space, with a short account of the history of geometry. Commenting on mathematicians' invention uh, of numerous spaces, mostly at the kind of end of the 19th century, 
form any any in the book he talks about uh, non euclidean geometry curved space and dimensional space infinite space topological space just uh, to name a few and Faber writes and this is a quote the proliferation of mathematical theories topologies thus aggravated the old problem of knowledge how a transition to be made from mathematical space, i.e. from the metal, mental capacities of the human species, from logic to nature in the first place, to practice in the second, and thence to theory of social life, which all presumably must unfold in space, end quote. So perhaps then we can think about the scholars I hear described as offering one answer to this old problem of knowledge. Turning to computer technology, they, and I should say mathematicians who work on the problem to this day, and, and there are many mathematicians that are still very much uh, engaged in this, uh, in this question today, have tried to bring the exactitude of abstract space onto the thickest of political and social problems. And they did so by superimposing, overlaying, and at times refusing to fundamentally separate the space of the mathematicians from the space of social practice on the one hand and geography on the other. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. I, I have many questions, including whether your overlay slides are a kind of reading of that uh, Lefebvrean interpretation of the space of mathematics, or mathem mathematicians, I should say. Um, but I will hold my questions until later. And uh, we now um, welcome Benedict Cluet. So Benedict Cluet is a doctoral candidate in architectural history at Columbia University's own Graduate School of Architectural Planning and Preservation. His writings and interviews have appeared in Harvard Design Magazine, Volume, Domus, The Architect's Newspaper, and San Rocco. And he's the author with Merlisa Wise of Forms of Aid, Architectures of Humanitarian Space, and that's from 2017. Um, welcome, Benedict, and thanks for joining us, and I'll let you share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Maybe I can see this. Yeah. Yep. The preview. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Lucia, for the invitation, um, and Tom uh, for sharing um, your uh, really compelling work. Prompted um, by Alma's account of the political geometry of electoral redistricting, uh, I'd like to indicate some potential directions uh, for research in the history of architecture to consider administrative geographies in relationship. To the politics of urban land, and to test some possibilities suggested by Alma's research in relation to my own work as an architectural historian who studies the uses of statistical cartography in the planning and design of large-scale urban projects in mid-20th century America. Specifically, I'd like to consider the status of electoral maps in the political maneuvering and negotiations over the siting of public housing in Chicago circa 1950 as part of the larger complex of means, for instance, uh, racially restrictive covenants, discriminatory financing and insurance practices through which residential segregation has been reproduced in American cities. I'll consider how the administrative geography of the city, in this case, the map of city council wards as local electoral districts conditioned, uh, conditioned the positions taken by the Chicago aldermen in negotiations with the Chicago Housing Authority. Under the authority of the city council, the selection of sites for large scale public housing in Chicago could be seen as a form of gerrymandering by other means, I'm suggesting. Moving populations rather than district lines, demolishing and building areas of the city with an eye toward the electoral map. The politics of the council and the debates over the selection of housing sites might be seen not only as an outgrowth of their constituents' presidents, uh, prejudices and fears of the encroachment, so to speak, of black families on white neighborhoods, identified as white neighborhoods, uh, or in deference to white dominated real estate boards. Um, these are you know, kind of two, uh, let's say, um, um, now conventional perhaps positions uh, in the literature, uh, 
Um, but also in relation to the geographical administrative logic or following almost term the political geometry of the internal boundaries of the city's wards. This is not to discount other analyses of the structuring effects of the racialization of the city's populations in the politics of urban renewal um, for existence, for example, by um, uh, Yamada Taylor or Preston Smith, um, but rather to extend those analyses, those analyses in considering how ethno-racial categories codified statistically in local and federal housing censuses, surveys of housing, and urban research in the social sciences were brought to bear upon the politics of urban projects um, through the administrative map of the city. Maps of blight and redevelopment constitute another administrative geography overlaying the Chicago ward map, one similarly uh, derived from the census and other surveys of populations distributed over land. Uh, and this image um, on the left is uh, from the Chicago Planning Commission in 1942, showing areas uh, as blighted and to be rebuilt. Um, and in the same image as it appears in the Hilbersheimer, the architect uh, Hilbersheimer's book, The New City, um, it, yeah, or sorry, The New Regional Pattern, rather. Um, so turning to the case of Chicago, um, uh, in planning politics in the public interest of 1954, um, an early assessment of the um, political machinations of city housing authorities in the wake of the Federal Housing Act of 1949, the planner Martin Meyerson cites an anonymous Chicago politician who provides a summary of the biases of the city's voters in choosing candidates for aldermen. This is quoting Meyerson. Um, or, my, quoting Meyerson, rather, quoting this local politician um, who says, a Lithuanian won't vote for a Pole and a Pole won't vote for a Lithuanian. A German won't vote for either of them, but all three will vote for an, Ir uh, an Irishman. Meyerson introduces this anecdote in explaining the composition of the Chicago City Council, which he defines principally through racial and ethnic categories. One third of the council, says Meyerson, including most of its leaders were Irish Catholics, making them, quote, dominant in politics, with the remainder of the democratic majority divided between aldermen, Polish, uh, quote, Polish, Italian, Bohemian, Lithuanian, Slovak, or Greek extraction, he says, um, along with a few uh, German Republicans and Jewish aldermen of both parties. Meyerson notes conspicuously uh, that the council had only two black aldermen in 1950, Archibald Carey, a Republican, um, and William Harvey, a Democrat, a disproportionately small number in a city where black uh, population at that time made up 14% of the residents. He suggests that the disparity between the population of voters and the few black representatives in the council resulted from the residential segregation of the city, which concentrated supermajorities of black voters in a small number of wards, mostly on the near south side. If these, uh, if, so uh, says Meyerson, if they had not been so much concentrated in these few wards, if instead they had spread evenly over the whole city, he says, um, that black motor, uh, voters might have exercised greater influence on the uh, electoral outcomes of a larger number of aldermen, uh, which were often decided by only a few hundred votes. Meyerson's analysis suggests affinities between residential segregation and the technique sometimes termed packing in discussions of electoral redistricting. Packing, he refers to the drawing of administrative boundaries to create overwhelming majorities of a group of voters, whether identified by racial categories or by political parties, in a smaller number of districts, thereby guaranteeing that group or party a few landslide electoral victories rather than a potentially larger number of representatives elected across several more competitive districts. Packing is generally understood as effectively disenfranchising voters who side with the supermajority and diminishing the influence of their party in legislative bodies. Analyses of, gen of gerrymandering and the, uh, the kind of redistricting algorithms that uh, Alma discussed proceed from various, often implicit assumptions about the natural form of political communities, seeking to align the organic boundaries with those of the administrative unit. At the University of Chicago, sociologists working with the local community research committee in the 1920s and 30s, under the direction of Ernest Burgess and Vivian Palmer in cooperation with the regional office of the US Census Bureau, sought to define the natural extents of communities as a geographical subunit of city organization, dividing the city of Chicago into 75 community areas that were officially adopted by the city for use in planning 
um, and by the US Census in analyses of its data, uh, as well as being used by subsequent Ch uh, University of Chicago studies um, by Burgess and his colleagues. Uh, the community areas were determined by mapping patterns of race, country of origin, income levels, family size, and so on, based on extensive surveys of residents connected by the LCRC, the Local um, Community Research um, Committee, um, as well as by data from the census and local public health records to determine the natural order of the city as distinct from its arbitrary and artificial political boundaries. The impetus for the project was the recognition that the ward, which had been a statistical unit used to re report US census data since 1910, was useless in the eyes of the Chicago sociologists for studies of the city, um, subject as it was to distortions by political interests that would cause it to deviate from the natural geography of the community. Um, Vivian Palmer, um, uh, who worked with Burgess on this project, uh, specifically cited the intricately gerrymandered districts of the aldermen. She said, practically, ward districting early became a profitable uh, sport by local politicians who gerrymandered adroitly in an effort to so split the city that they could distribute their majorities and carry the maximum number of wards. To achieve this end, they frequently maneuvered lines to cut across the natural groupings whose strength they wish to destroy." End quote. Um, the city's first charter, uh, established in, 19, uh, in 1837, uh, um, established the offices of the mayor and the aldermen and divided Chicago, like all of all, um, says uh, Vivian Palmer, into three parts, um, south side, north side, and west side, which were further divided into two wards each with two aldermen elected per ward. The number of wards increased over the course of the 19th century as the city incorporated surrounding areas. And the map at the left shows um, uh, a map of 35 wards, which was um, uh, the, the state between uh, 1889 with a round of annexations um, uh, and 1923. Um, and in 1923, the system was changed to 50 wards with one alderman representing each ward in the city council with the redrawing of ward boundaries required by Illinois state law after each federal census to ensure representation on the basis of equal populations. Um, Meyerson's intimation that efforts to restrict uh, Black residents to a few Southside neighborhoods and their corresponding wards might constitute a form of electoral packing uh, established through the physical and uh, social segregation of residents in their homes rather than by the moving of boundaries on an electoral map um, was made in the context of a year-long struggle between officials at the Chicago Housing Authority and the aldermen over the lo location of 12,000 units of public housing at the first round of a total of 21,000 units in Chicago to be funded through the Federal uh, Housing Act of 1949. Despite having secured $210 million in federal funding for land acquisition and for both some uh, slum clearance uh, and reconstruction, the CH, uh, CHA was nonetheless bound by an Illinois state law um, passed that same year, which required the CHA to receive approval from the city council on the siting and redevelopment plans uh, for public housing. In developing Chicago's first public housing projects in the late 1930s, the CHA had employed methods for surveying and scoring neighborhoods that were initially codified by researchers at the Federal Housing Administration for the purposes of assessing risks in underwriting federally insured mortgages. And that's the image on the left, um, uh, part of the complex today known as redlining. Um, uh, this map produced in 1938 as part of the planning of the IDB Wells homes uses the D-grade districts extending over much of Chicago's central wards uh, and central areas as a proxy for blighted areas requiring demolition and redevelopment. Um, the transition from the D-districts of Chicago's, um, of the CHA's 1938 map, based on the FHA's mortgage, uh, mortgage risk maps, to a definition of blighted uh, areas that would legally authorize condemnation was accomplished by the research division of the Chicago Plan Commission in preparing the 1943 Master Plan for Residential Land Use in Chicago on the basis of the findings of the Chicago Land Use Survey of 1942, um, which was jointly connected with the WPA. Um, the CPC's research for the Master Plan, including the definition and mapping of blighting area, uh, blighted areas, was directed by Homer Hoyt, 
um, who was by then uh, the research director um, for the CPC, um, but who had previously led research at the FHA uh, on the FHA's mortgage underwriting manual and risk maps in the 1930s. Uh, and this, um, these slides just show uh, on the left, the types of planning areas um, categorized by light and conservation. Um, and then in the middle, um, an image from the land use survey that documents the methods used um, showing the use of these acetate overlay maps, um, where they actually also describe how these overlay maps could be combined and recomposited um, to create different uh, valuations, um, depending on different planning uses later. Um, uh, noting that they're all drawn at the same scale and on acetates so that they can be recomposited. Uh, and then on the right, um, uh, images of the survey forms, the survey schedules, which were taken out of the field and used by the 1500 surveyors um, who were part of the, um, the survey effort with the CPC and the WPA. Uh, and then on the bottom, the, the whole of the cards that were actually used to uh, encode those into a form that could be used for further calculations. Um, the CHA, under the leadership of Chairman uh, Robert Roshan Taylor and Executive Secretary Elizabeth Wood, made broad use of its powers to clear blighted areas, so called blighted areas, for housing. Um, their initial group of developments in 1938 to 1940 used slum clearance in both majority white and uh, majority black neighborhoods, uh, with the housing abiding by the so called neighborhood composition rule which specified that new public housing developments should not alter the racial demographics of their surrounding area. Um, yet by the 1940s, the CHA was also increasingly um, defending itself against accusations in the city council of using public housing to pursue in, uh, integration. Following the award of funds from the 1949 Federal Housing Act, CHA's initial proposal to the council included a mix of vacant and clearance sites um, 5,000 units on four clearance sites, three of which were in predominantly black neighborhoods, and 5,000 units on three vacant sites in majority white areas on the outskirts of the city. This proposal was rejected by the Housing Committee of the Council, and more importantly, by a group of small but influential aldermen, um, including uh, Johnny uh, F. Duffy, to whom um, Mayor Martinelli um, delegated the negotiations on the sites between the council um, and the CHA. According to Meyerson's account, several aldermen in Duffy's far south side plot um, could be expected to win only one more election in their ward due to the, rap the, um, due to the rapidly demogra uh, shifting demographics in their neighborhoods. Um, in their counter proposal uh, of 12,000 units, all, um, all of the areas uh, designated for new housing were located on clearance sites in black neighborhoods. Uh, and so this is uh, one of the results of those, um, in considering the, the build consequences, uh, uh, is the Robert Taylor Homes, um, uh, ironically named after the um, Chicago housing chairman who lost this battle against the city council. Um, in the now canonical account of historian Arnold Hirsch in his book, Making the Second Ghetto, the council's position on the, um, on the public housing uh, sites constituted a, quote, strategy of containment uh, a term that Elizabeth Wood of the CHA had herself used uh, of the black population. But uh, as I suggest, it also reinforced the political rewards of segregation alongside the the, um, the political rewards of segregation alongside the gerrymandering of wards. The built consequence of the council's negotiations was this two mile long stretch of public housing projects in the south side, um, including uh, Stateway Gardens and uh, Robert Taylor Homes shown here. Um, the conflict between the CHA and Council um, took place in the context not only of the 1949 Federal Housing Act, but also in the wake of um, the 1947 Illinois um, state law, the Blighted Areas Redevelopment Act, which allowed local authorities to form partnerships with private development um, to construct privately funded housing on land acquired and cleared by the city. Um, the act and the creation of the Chicago Land Clearance Commission led to partnerships between the CHA and the Southside Planning Board, um, which were the group um, formed by Michael Reese Hospital and the Illinois Institute of Technology, um, primarily, uh, but also integrating other uh, local leaders and city booster or uh, civic boosters in the Southside. Um, the the Southside Planning Bureau was initially formed to protect institutional uh, the institutional interests of IIT and Michael Reese Hospital. Mm -hmm. 
by combating, quote, blight and advocating, quote, slum clearance, working at times closely with the CHA and Chicago Plan Commission, uh, with Walter Gropius as uh, an architectural consultant, uh, and with the recent uh, GSD graduates, Martin Meyerson, uh, who wrote the book um, that I was citing earlier, uh, and Reginald Isaacs uh, at Michael Reese Hospital. Um, uh, and this is another image from this, uh, this report from the Southside Planning Board um, showing these two super blocks, including uh, a CHA housing site at the top right here, um, which would replace this uh, lighted area, so called lighted area, um, which is identified as a study area for this project. Um, and this document um, was, was seen by the CHA, sorry, by the CHA, but also by the Southside Planning Board. Um, helping to attract the New York Life Insurance Company, um, which constructed on that site, on the same site, um, uh, eventually uh, the Lake Meadows housing by SOM on the left. Um, and so this is what replaced uh, um, the red square um, at, or the super block shown in that previous uh, image, um, uh, as well as the Dearborn, uh, the Dearborn homes, which were on the right, um, Global Schlossman and Bennett, um, which were the first outcomes of the partnership between the Chicago um, uh, Housing Authority and the South Side Planning Board. And the Dearborn home, homes on the right were actually built to rehouse residents who were displaced uh, by the um, Lake Meadows project on the left, as well as other um, projects of, of so-called slum clearance in the South Side. Um, so in conclusion, in considering uh, the maps of electoral redistricting, um, and blight and slum clearance, so-called, uh, and the redevelopment um, projects of the CHA. Um, uh, in considering these maps as in forms of administrative maps that define boundaries of local areas, that differentiate uh, and establish forms of legal and political authority in relationship to the people, land, and buildings um, that reside there. Um, I would suggest uh, the questions of how the media of blight maps, specifically the use of scoring and thresholds, uh, applied to quantitative uh, or statistical survey data to, differ to differentiate uh, areas of the city rather than single buildings, um, how those light maps link up with other imperatives in 20th century urbanism that also favor um, forms like, for instance, the superblock. Um, and those would include thing, uh, you know, criteria like economies of scale or constructability of large um, scale and automobility. Um, and further, uh, following Alma's research um, um, uh, in, in, in accounting for um, the role of blight maps as a form of administrative map, um, I'd like to consider the entrainments of uh, political and legal boundaries in urban renewal as they intersect with uh, the racialized politics of cities. Um, as this map by the Chicago Urban League's uh, research department demonstrates, and this was actually submitted as part of a hearing on, on housing in Chicago in front of the uh, U.S. Uh, Senate Subcommittee on Housing. Um, as this map by the Urban League demonstrates, the administrative map of areas of the city designated for, quote, slum clearance and redevelopment under urban renewal are a product of the already racialized geographies of the city. And so this is showing, um, just to kind of break this down a little bit, um, areas uh, that the Urban League understands as, as uh, Black residential areas in orange, uh, and the dots are all of the different um, projects uh, undertaken by uh, um, the Chicago Housing Authority and other urban renewal affiliated uh, uh, organizations. Um, and so what they're showing is the relationship of these geographies um, in the city uh, and how they correspond to the already racialized uh, geography of segregation. Um, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Benedict and Alma. And if this were a live event, we would be clapping. Feel free, and I, guess, I hope that the seminar audience, who we cannot see, are clapping in, um, in the privacy of their own screen. Um, thank you both. Um, and it's thank you especially for having brought what to my mind is a somewhat consistent depiction of the graphic universe that was being bandied about in the 40s and 50s and 60s in the United States. I'm particularly struck, I'll let you kind of gather your thoughts to ask questions to each other. But one thing I'm struck by, which will eventually beg the question of a kind of literacy on the part of the public, what, what visual literacy existed on the part of the public 
vis-a-vis -vis these kinds of graphic representations. I'm asking specifically because, of course, today we are, you know, the New York Times infographics department is very well equipped and they periodically get on the front page, whereas one imagines that uh, there are some techniques that are remarkably consistent that seem novel maybe to the people you're talking about. Both of you have moments where an overlay is clearly the sort of most up-to-date uh, graphic technique and, and a correspondence is promised. Um, and this strikes me as it must be novel in some way. I see Benedict, your, your architects are still posing in front of models and it's a model of the Chirada Guiana. So it's clearly not really what they're doing but they feel the need to depict themselves more maybe more traditionally as moving blocks around. Whereas what they're really doing is flipping transparencies on the page. And you too, Alma, the idea that what you do is that there's an overlapping of things. So just the idea of overlay. And the second thing is the distinction between a straight line, geometric um, in the sense that it's a Cartesian grid and a soft line. So Alma, you spoke about this conflict between, or to what extent is the hand line already seen as preferable as part of a critique of high modernist mathematics, let's say, or is this purely accidental? And, and you too, Benedict, your super block plans in the end have kind of soft patches of, uh, you know, the last image, not the very last image you showed, but the one before at the architectural scale, we have the grid, but then in the end we have kind of soft edges. So I wondered to what extent this was already a critique of kind of gridded boundaries. So anyways, those are my questions. Don't, you don't feel you have to answer them now, but. I leave you to you know sort of ask each other each other questions and it, it, to the audience if you want to put your questions in the chat we'll also gather those and read them out loud. Well, I mean, if I could just speak to the question of literacy and how that maybe intersects with some of the the um, stories I was telling. Um, you know, one of the ambitions actually in the creation of the, the community um, areas that um, it was part of that mapping process that I showed by the uh, local community research committee of the University of Chicago, which became the um, social science research uh, committee, um, was to actually publish uh, this book, which was released in several editions uh, um, from the 30s um, uh, forward every 10 years. Um, called the Local Community Fact Book, which um, several editions of it were edited by Lewis Worth. Um, and it was deliberately conceived as this kind of um, a reference for citizens in the city of Chicago to understand the city better and be able to use it in, you know, um, yeah, in you know, exactly the types of um, electoral processes, presumably electoral, but also just, uh, I guess, any other form of um, democratic uh, uh, debate. Um, and so there was that agenda, at least, uh, even behind these very seemingly kind of um, technical and sophisticated uh, mapping, mapping methodologies to create some kind of public facing version of that. And the idea of these, these um, community areas, in the case of the University of Chicago research, um, was part of that. And on the overlays, there are examples of earlier mapping in the context of uh, planning processes that use um, uh, transparent overlays and um, create composite maps out of those. What I think is distinct and, and relatively you know, um, novel in the use of, of, of these acetate overlays in the case of the um, maps by the Chicago Plan Commission is the way in which they're understood to correspond, um, the correspondence between a visual layer and a data set. And the, the way that those can be recomposited and effectively visually rescored, depending on um, a different set of you know, imperatives relating to a different planning process later. And that was the ambition of, of these maps would that be that they could be, the layers could be separable and recombinable uh, in different ways, depending on what the, the mandate was, let's say later. Uh, and I think that's something that it is relatively early, early in the emergence of these um, techniques. Um, I mean, if I can jump in a little bit again on this question, both of this question of the overlay and on the um, question of a kind of visual literacy. I mean, it's, it's in terms of visual literacy, it's, it's interesting because at least for the, uh, 
early 1960s, a lot of the information that comes out, especially from these uh, attempts to use computers, is in fact just charts, tables with numbers, um, right? Uh, it's not actual maps. It's then there's an extra uh, step. Um, and in fact, it's very hard to find at least uh, I've had a hard time finding until now, um, a lot of attempts to kind of uh, popularize uh, the popularize this different districting in, in a visual medium, in a truly visual medium. Um, I think that this is where, I think that when it comes to the kind of overlay, this is again, one of this moment, I think this is what was so uh, exciting, at least for some of those, um, uh, for some of those researchers, is this idea that when you use the computer, the computer, for example, can, can change, but the overlay can remain the same. So you can, you can, you can, you can, you know, if you use um, commuting patterns as an overlay on, but but you can now re rearrange district. You can rearrange things, uh, so you can keep one thing static, one kind of one overlay static, while rearranging another, and trying to see how boundaries will really kind of correspond to one another. And I think that was the most exciting thing at the time in terms of the kind of capacity um, of the technology. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of, Benedict, can I go back to kind of one of the last thing that you just said, which is, I, I think it's so interesting because it, it goes to some of the things that uh, comes up a little bit in my research, is exactly what you're saying about this tension between the kind of data sets on the one hand and their mapping um, uh, or kind of uh, visual. And can you say a little bit more about in the in the in the different cases that you're looking at and how how that process is done and how people how the the people involved actually thinking about that? Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about which which of those maps would maybe be the most. Um, I mean, so many of the like even the the first group of maps that I started with, which were from Meyerson's book, um, uh, Planning Politics in the Public Interest. Um, in the notes, he, he um, cites that these were have been redrawn from um, maps produced by the City Planning Commission and the um, City Housing Authority. And so that was actually in the case of um, the maps used in, you know, both by official uh, local government agencies um, and by, um, architects working sometimes on behalf of either private developers or um, public-private partnership type organizations like um, the Southside Planning Board, um, that was really a source that was used um, quite extensively uh, in the replanning. And so that was in terms of the relationship of the collection of data to the, that group of maps, which were um, part of this land survey the, the report of land survey um, um, uh, uh, commission in Chicago that, that came out in 1942, um, and that was followed immediately after by the Chicago Plan Commission's uh, residential, a master plan of residential land use in Chicago. Um, so that that set of data and those maps corresponding to that data um, were produced as part of this uh, joint effort of the WPA. Um, and the Chicago Plan Commission, um, the mayor uh, in Chicago um, had sought funding uh, related to you know, uh, money being made available through the WPA through the, after the New Deal um, to undertake this. And this is actually something that was you know, greatly sort of advocated for by the Chicago Housing Authority um, to use this WPA money to hire, in the end it was 1500 surveyors um, to conduct these block by block, building by building surveys in the city. And so that image that I showed of the, this card, which is, a, it's a, so there's the Hall of the card, but then there's also the, the survey form. So that was something that in some ways similar to the surveys that um, the uh, Chicago, um, the University of Chicago um, Sociology Department had undertaken. They were block by block surveys where they did in, uh, interviews with residents. Um, and recorded things like the age of buildings, the, the, uh, the racial categories to which the residents were understood to correspond, um, and uh, the, the percentage of buildings that were um, rented versus owned, the, the, um, the levels of, of rent that were received, et cetera. Um, so that was all done by you know, um, surveying 
block by block. And then um, those um, forms were then encoded in, into these Hollerith cards. That's the piece actually that unfortunately, um, the, the, the report by the Land Use Commission says that these were, you know, a, an important product, the Hollerith cards themselves were a major product of the, of the process. I'm not exactly sure yet, at least I haven't found really evidence for how those cards were actually used subsequently, but at least at the time they wanted to build them as a significant product of that, um, of that survey. Um, so that was more or less the process. And then at the same time, um, maps were drawn. Um, the, the acetate sheets that I showed showed the base map and then an overlay, um, which was drawn on top of that, which would reflect the data that was collected on those survey forms um, and would break it down. So the, the, the land use plan, rather the report of the land use survey, parts of which are included in the land use plan, um, you know, breaks down all of the different racial categories of neighborhoods in the city, areas that have um, the majority of houses that were built before 1895, which was one of the criteria for designating blighting neighborhoods. Um, so all of that um, is, is basically part of this WPA CBC process that then goes into the report uh, on land use and then goes immediately into the master plan for residential land use. So it sounds like statistics, it sounds like the survey is a layer that is uh, sort of factual, let's say, it, using Alma's model that there's one layer that's fixed and another that is used. It sounds like there the, the calculative fact is the survey done by humans door to door, et cetera. And then eventually a, a kind of second stage statistical uh, thinking, density of people, likelihood that they would move, that they voting behavior, et cetera, is overlaid. And that's when spatial patterns also, that's when planning occurs. In, in your case, Alma, I was struck by that, by the fact that the spatial aspect comes almost by accident, like land, if this is our theme, by accident, they start drawing land. But in the original, when you describe that they basically have lists of numbers and it's, you can hear it in their, in their fear, the fear of the number, the fear that people will be interchangeable. It must be because they see just lists of numbers. But I, I suppose my question is, so is there any aha moment at the moment that they realize that what they're doing is they're figuring, you know, pieces of land? Or is there any ways the, the map is there already? And so that's seen as part of this shift that you're describing from a kind of abstract model to more applied, uh, you know, uh, oversight, like that the computer is there to make oversight rather than, you know, actually give you something from scratch. No, I mean, I think that there is this worry, at least at the beginning of, and this is, this, there's this worry that, right, that, that if you treat people just as number, right, and you, you kind of do, you just, they're interchangeable, right? So there is some of this worry, but that is where the kind of, I think that this is where there are all of them, I think, to some degree, and all of them, and I just gave three examples. There are, there are many more uh, practitioners at a time that try to, uh, think how can you use computers to to deal with this to deal with this question? Um, there, are, each one is trying to come with a different way of now um, combining in some way the kind of geographical and the more numerical information. And it's about the imaginations. Uh, for me, what's interesting is the way they kind of. Uh, kind of the sort of imaginaries that they come up with of trying to think about new measurements, new way of thinking about uh, the land and the people together uh, uh, as what I find so interesting about, about, about those early moments. Um, and again, they, they are all, they all believe, again, they all believe that the computer offers something, right? I mean, I mean, in part, it's this shiny new tool probably, but, but besides the fact that it's just like, uh, shiny and new, I think that they believe that the computer offers something, that there is some, um, there's something that the computer can do that humans cannot do. And that at, at that point, it really is about the ability to calculate, right? I mean, it's not, it's still not graphic. Uh, so it's the question of how can you utilize that calculative capacity uh, to then imagine the, those geographical um, and or civic boundaries uh, uh, and demographic boundaries completely a, a little bit different. Um, and 
yeah, I mean, it's 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 exactly this sort of tension that I think is so uh, it's kind of so interesting in that moment. Benedict, do you want to direct a question at uh, Alma? Yeah, so I actually, my, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, uh, the th one aspect that I really found curious uh, in, in the discussion of these different algorithms for redrawing boundaries, the, I understand the political um, sort of theoretical basis of the idea of equal representation as being measurable by numerically in relationship to the population. So that's sort of one criteria that, that all of those algorithms are working with is the idea that there should be some kind of relatively equal um, population, an equalization of population between different districts. The, the other um, criterion that most of those algorithms are prioritizing, I think actually all of them prioritize it and some of them add other criteria as well, uh, is, is compactness. Um, and compactness, I mean, I, I'm thinking about this in relationship to what I was describing about the research on the, the natural form of the community. Um, that compactness seems like a, a kind of much less interrogated assumption at the basis of all of those algorithms. And you know, you see this as a as a criteria, uh, as a criterion in the um, in the drawing of national boundaries after civil wars or after uh, uh, independence mm -hmm. in some countries, because in national boundaries compactness is important because you can minimize the amount of, of, of border, which is from a national security standpoint seen as, as good. Um, but it doesn't really make as much sense when you're thinking about electoral districts, like, like why does it matter whether you have a long border or not? And so at least in reading, uh, reading your essay, that was, that was something that really seemed to me that for whatever reason, the, the, the people working on these algorithms somehow didn't have to demonstrate the relevance of that as a criterion. Almost, and my, 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 my hunch, let's say, is that it has something to do with like the, you know, the original political cartoon of, of the gerrymander, this kind of like monstrous yeah. bird lizard um, in, in Massachusetts. There's just something that is aesthetically, let's say, um, objectionable about the form of the gerrymandered district that makes compactness a kind of um, um, a, 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 a criteria that requires no external justification. But I'm, I know there probably are other uh, reasons that that was um, foregrounded as part of the algorithm. And I just wonder if you could kind of expand on that. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't come, right? So the idea that compactness is important doesn't come um, from those researchers. This, that has a kind of longer um, uh, legislative uh, history. This idea of compactness. I think in part it's kind of goes, you, you kind of hit there the exact point when you brought up this the lizard, right? The gerrymandering lizard, which is it's I think it seems uh, it's seen in the most kind of minimal sense as um, as a test against gerrymandering, right? If you that in a way that if that if you if you say that the, the district needs to be uh, compact, it's a way of kind of protecting against. Com, right, complete randomness, right? That, that is the, this is actually the example exactly that the Grazia say. If you don't care about it at all about any kind of, uh, if, you, if you forget about geography, and if, right, if you forget the, ge the, kind of the geography, the, the kind of boundedness um, of the land, then you can just decide that there are, you know, there are 10, there are 10 district in a, in a state. We're gonna draw uh, numbers from a hat. Each, you know, you will be in a district with somebody in, you know, you'll be in a district uh, with somebody um, in upstate New York and somebody, you know, all around, all around the states. It just, it will be complete, completely random. So once they bound it, right, once this, there is this idea that the district should represent actual kind of communities, I think that the, that's where the notion of compactness comes in as a, as a first, uh, first kind of line, first line of protections against, uh, against uh, gerrymandering. Um, and again, not all states have that to be said to, it's not all states today even, not all states have that as a requirement for their districting. Uh, and uh, even though, and the other part of it is that even though compactness is um, 
something that again like have quite a long historical um, legis a, a long um, legisl legislative history there is not agreement of what it is there, 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 okay so everybody can say that a circle is, is but that's once you kind of give up on the idea that you can use perfect geometry um, then again the kind of question of how you actually going to define compactness is is not obvious uh, uh, at all so but in I mean, some way yeah go for it no i mean i was going to say that it's so so interesting that the I think what's novel is what you're describing, that compactness keeps you from complete uh, uh, distribution. The idea that you could potentially have it completely distributed randomly, that's wonderful. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you study uh, cities, there are many cities that are linear because, and there are many settlements that are linear because they obey a certain geographic feature. So there are cities that are along river, not, an, you know, it, I wonder if there's not a kind of, uh, assumption of a kind of central place theory almost in both your cases actually that basically a neighborhood is something that is in you know looks pretty much like this and that and even the critique of the of the gerrymandered bird of course one understands it but linearity is one of the crucial things in bad districts right districts look gerrymandered when they're very linear but there are quite a few modes of settlement that are linear uh, they're just not sort of modern they're not germane to modern urban planning. So um, in a way, one would want a critique that would not be applied to cities like Chicago, because of course there's, there's also an assumption there. One could say there's also an assumption there that basically the best thing a grid could do is to make neighborhoods that still resemble villages with a center and that are compact, you know, like a circle, but they're modern and, and in a grid. So one would want a case study that, you know, rural community that is along a geographic feature that's really strong like a geographic feature that really pushes pressure on where people can or cannot kind of settle. Um, yeah, but, but so this idea, Ahmed, that, that you could pick people out of a hat, um, it, that's purely uh, counterfactual, right? Nobody's actually yes. proposing to do that. Yes, 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 it's completely counterfactual, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in it fact, the computer in, your, the computer in your case is not really being asked to do anything except iterate, like get to the answer faster, right? Can you say more about yeah. that? I mean, in the, yes, the, the, the idea is that you, and even in some of, some of the um, um, uh, papers themselves, the kind of the authors will say, this could potentially be done, but if you try to do it with human capacities, it will take forever. So the idea is that you, the, the, what the computer can do is con continuously iterate and um, offer this kind of small, um, um, small iteration, but uh, a lot of those small iterations so that by the end of it, you will get some, some, sort, of, some sort of a solution that you wouldn't be able to do uh, uh, if you if you weren't using the computer, but that's exactly what I'm saying. That in the 1960s, at the end of the day, most legislative, they some of them, you know, even New York, for example, they they um, they work with certain companies uh, that offer those kind of dis uh, computer districting. At the end of the day, they said no. This is there's there's certain they even said there's certain things that you can just do by hand much better, uh, and they still trust it because being uh, the having those kind of knowledge of the state and knowledge, it was seen as something that was still um, something that a certain kind of individual had those sort of expertise. Uh, and they knew the district, they knew like kind of right there, the kind of politician that actually knew the district, knew the state, uh, understood it well enough. And it's something that couldn't be mechanized, something that couldn't be just uh, uh, moved into this statistical data. Right. I mean, it's actually something that made me think about uh, Benedict in your, in your talk. I thought it's so interesting about the, the University of Chicago survey, uh, where they come up with those um, community, uh, those community boundaries. Right? Uh, 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 where where does this idea of right that that the boundaries of the cities are needs to be kind of redrawn are really coming yeah. from? Right. Because that's again, it has to do with knowing it that it's you can't use the census, you can't use just just the statistical knowledge. Well, so I mean, the the reason that that this becomes a, a kind of obsession for the sociologists at Chicago uh, has to do with the fact that in since 1910, after 1910, um, that when the census, the U.S. census, when it would uh, report its results, uh, it would actually use the ward map. The ward map was treated almost like um, it was, you know, you would see these kind of um, uh, choropleth maps 
where the statistics of the census would be then mapped as um, you know shadings, hatchings, levels of, of gradient on um, the ward map. They recognized that the ward map was you know in many ways something that was constantly being manipulated politically, um, and so this is something where there is there's this um, uh, you know dichotomy that's posed in the writings of, around this uh, local community research committee's work on in, in collaboration with the census um, between the natural form of the community and these kind of administrative political boundaries that are you know, constantly being redrawn in favor of different um, electoral interests. And so that's, yeah. That's, but is, that's there a sense that, is there a sense that the community has these kind of natural, natural boundaries? Yes, I mean that's that's entirely what. So it's it's curious because on the one hand, yeah. So they're using census data, but also they are also doing a one of these kind of block by block, building by building survey processes, um, and uh, and using that to identify criteria that will allow them to create those seventy five groupings, and then those seventy five groupings are then. Um, adopted officially by the city for use in its planning, but also by the US census, uh, along with the census tract. So that that same process, or really it's, it's, a, it's a project that comes out of that local community areas mapping uh, and surveying process that um, develops the, the census tract as a, as a format that's still used today by the census. Yeah. It's really incredible that this idea that there's natural boundaries and those can be devised by a team of people with clipboards knocking yeah. on doors, going up um, proto, you know, uh, tenement housing. I mean, it's really incredible the amount to which architectural typology basically feeds right into what is understood as a natural you know, data set, basically. Um, so we are out of time. Oh, we have two minutes left. Um, I want to ask someone, to, one of you to tell me, when is it that statistics are and probability, let's say prediction, are used to actually make the census and begins to be seen as preferable to counting people one by one. Do you know this? Uh, so it's not mm. it, it's not used. So the, there's a Supreme Court, so you cannot, so part of the problem with the census um, is that for at least, so the, it's actually, I'll, 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 so for, for the purpose of apportionment, there's a Supreme Court case from 1999, maybe 2000, I don't remember, that uh, you're not allowed to use statistical um, oh, okay. kind of sampling. In fact, you have to count everyone. So count. even though, even though, so, so certain purposes of the census you actually can use, but not for apportionment okay. or congressional apportionment, uh, even though it's less accurate. So even Correct, though they right. know for a fact is, that it's less accurate. Right. Yeah. So essentially the question for another conversation perhaps is at some point it becomes obvious that actually imagining that you can have a record of each person in their space that's less easily done than by a computer. And one wants to know to what extent the, does computation use spatial knowledge to do this whether natural ones or not. Um, so, um, all right, I see that Joseph Bedford has asked a question which to which we clearly don't have the time to answer. His question is methodological. How does Benedict's um, work, how is it affected by his being um, an architectural scholar as opposed to another one? Um, hopefully Joseph will join us for the next <laughs> event that we can answer that question more broadly. Um, and in general, I wanna thank um, Alma and Benedict so much for playing along, uh, sending papers to each other, responding to each other, um, and uh, you know, uh, indulging us in our in our theme for the semester. So thank and thank you to the audience for joining, and we will see you in two weeks for um, Tim Mitchell and Stephanie Barral. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.